Red foxes are widely beloved, and that for good reasons. They are smart, playful, and just adorable. Not a surprise, therefore, that people love drawing them too and create all sorts of cute and pretty fox designs. So let me help you make your own that fits your personal style with simple and straightforward techniques. Hey there, and welcome to my beginner's drawing tutorial about red foxes. So the plan is to show and explain to you how to draw two simple designs created by me. But I will not just explain how to draw them, but also how I designed them and the reasons for my design choices, so that you can learn from it and make your own. Now this tutorial should not be too difficult to follow along, however I will mention a good amount of techniques. Not all of them are going to be essential, and you don't have to memorize every single thing. However, I want you to at least have seen and heard of them, in case you might want to learn more about them later. So keep that in mind if you might start to feel overwhelmed. There is no pressure. Alright, enough intro talk, let's get to it. Thank you. Okay then, let's draw this dubby cute little guy. Starting off with a very simple pose that doesn't require a whole lot of techniques. We'll get to the slightly more challenging parts later. So one common part to start with is the head. A plain old circle suffices as the base shape. It's not important that it's perfect, just make sure that it don't drift away too much. You can flip your canvas or look at it through a mirror to help yourself see if anything is wonky. Next we choose the direction where this little guy is looking. For that purpose we draw some center lines. We keep things simple though, so it's just going to look straightforward. The easiest angle. Now which part of the face you start with is pretty much up to you. I personally like to start with the nose. It is slightly below the intersection of the center lines, because if we take a close look at this fox design from other angles and poses, you see that the snout has this round bump shape. See how the snout starts from the horizontal center line, but then slightly curves down towards the tip? This shows why I place the nose a bit lower. For this angle I don't need to draw any extra lines for the snout, so yay, let's work. Next up let's draw the eyes. Just some round button eyes, couldn't be simpler than that. I place them on the horizontal center line, however the spacing between them is up to you. Place them really far apart and it's gonna look hilariously derpy. Put them super close to each other and it's also gonna look quite silly, but in a way that makes the face look very small. However, I'm aiming more so for a cute and a derpy design, so I'm gonna place them in the middle of those two extremes. This design, as you can see, has no mouth. It's actually a detail that you can omit. Less things to draw, and it still looks very cute. I mean, it works for Hello Kitty after all. Next up the ears. They are supposed to be in a neutral upwards position. There are many different ways for how you could draw them. Let's start with the outer side. Here we draw the angle slightly pointing outwards. The height of the ear is not super long, but also not super short. Make sure that the line is not straight, but slightly curved. Then we connect it with the inner ear corner. We also need to pay attention to the gap here, at the top of the head. The tip of the ear should have a little bit of roundness instead of being pointy. Also adding some ear fluff. For that we are drawing a line parallel to the inner side of the ear, leaving a small gap at the top. And then from the bottom we add two spikes. Leave a little gap here. The fluff is supposed to look soft, so don't make the tips look too sharp. You can do that by adding some curvature to the lines, instead of drawing them straight. In general, a good way to draw a softer looking fur. Alright, quickly drawing the second ear on the other side. Foxes can move the ears independently from each other, so I could draw this ear in a different angle. But for now, let's keep things simple. Now on to adjusting the head shape by adding some big flutes on the side. The first one goes from the bottom of the head to the center. I add a little bit of extra length, however you could add a whole lot more. The second, smaller first strand connects with the outer ear corner. I can also continue into the ear a little bit, that way the outer ear corner is pushed further to the back. That's one thing you should keep in mind. When fox ears are at the resting default position, they don't point straight forward, but slightly to the side. So by putting the inner ear corner in front of the head shape and the outer ear corner behind it, you can create that sense of angle very easily. 
at least for this pose. Of course, the other side needs some extra fluffiness too. Okay, the last thing for the face is to draw the fur pattern on it. In real life, it starts from the nose, goes towards underneath the eyes, leaving a small gap, and then goes to the side of the face. How exactly you are shaping it is up to you though. I normally draw a simple line that curves upwards at first, and then one that curves down. In general, I want to avoid drawing perfectly straight lines. The curvature adds to the overall soft look of this little friend. And with that we have sketched out the complete head. Already looking very cute. Now then, let's continue with the body. We need to have some rough idea of the size ratio between the head and the body. This Fox Design's body is roughly the same size as the head, so it looks a bit stubby and short, which is intentional to make it extra adorable looking. You can go for very different proportions though. The head could be even more than twice as large as the body to create a super exaggerated chibi look. Or you go for a more realistic size ratio. However, you can overdo it. A head that is significantly smaller just looks odd. And a microscopically tiny body is also just ridiculous. But between those extremes you got lots of freedom of choice. Okay, so there are two things that I commonly do to start sketching out the body and get an idea for how I should shape it. The first thing would be a line that follows the back. For that purpose we draw a short line starting from the back bottom of the head. There are many different ways for how to draw this simple line. It is supposed to give you a very quick idea for how the body would be arranged. You know, imagining everything just in your head and perfectly converting that image to shapes on the drawing surface is difficult. I am also far from perfect from it. Simple guidelines like these act as an assistance for your brain to fill in the rest. Like when I look at this line in relation to the head, I can already imagine how the rest of the body would be arranged, and if it doesn't fit, I'll redo it. It's okay to redraw it over and over again since it's so quick and effortless to do. So this pose is supposed to be a neutral standing pose, mostly facing frontwards. Therefore, the line stays very short. Alright, the second thing I like to do is to sketch in a curved triangular shape right where the chest is located. In this case, the height of this shape is slightly smaller than the height of the circle that we originally drew for the head. That's because the body itself is not all that big. This shape gives us a better idea of where the chest is pointing. Depending on how much curvature you give it, it can also convey the feeling of twisting the body like for more dynamic poses. I'll talk more about that later though. And with that we can roughly sketch out the basic body shape, which in this case is just a short sausage. Now let's add some legs. The tip of this triangle is going between the front legs and we're using the full width of the body. The length of these legs is about the same height as the body, so quite short, but they have some considerable thickness to them. The lines are not completely straight but slightly curved. We want to avoid perfectly straight lines as much as possible. Then we add a little bump on the feet to indicate some little toes. I'm not going to give the toes any more detail than that though. Again, this design is supposed to be minimalist and simple. Now one trait that really adds to the typical look of red foxes are the dark boots. Well, not all red fox subspecies have them, but a lot of them. By the way, did you know that there are 45 different red fox subspecies? It's a whole lot more than just the typical North American and European red foxes. So then, we could just draw a straight line for the boots and that's it, but like with everything else, we want to give it some curvature, some shape that's softer and more interesting. So what I usually do is pull that line upwards at the front of the leg. Not only does this look better in my opinion, but it's also a bit more accurate to their natural fur pattern. Of course, again, it's not that important that this design is realistic. It's just a little side note. Okay, let's give this chest some more shape. This triangle does not suffice. To make it fluffier looking, simply draw a big strand of fur. Just continue the line from the bottom, extend it to the side, and then create a big spike, returning back to the neck. I do this also for the other side, however the one that points to the rest of the body is shorter. Now for the back legs, once again I draw a simple curve downwards. The bottom of the feet is slightly above the bottom of the front feet to add a little bit of perspective. 
If we assume that we, the viewers, are at eye height with this little guy, then the ground on which the fox stands on is slightly slanted. Just a little perspective knowledge as a side note. And the hind legs get some dark boots too, of course. I keep those a bit shorter though. Now for the tail, I recommend drawing it in a pose that is always visible and not completely hidden behind the body. It adds so much character to the drawing. So this tail design is super simple. Just draw a circle that overlaps with the butt, doesn't have to be perfect, and the size is about the same as the head circle that we drew at the beginning. To draw the tip we add two curves, one that follows the same curvature as the circle, just more extended, and the second curve is an S-curve, so when the curves meet, they are going to form a sharper tip. It would also be possible to draw both curves the same way to create a softer, symmetric looking tail tip. This design choice, like all the others, is up to you. I'm just giving you some ideas. And lastly, we need to draw the fur pattern for the tip. For that purpose, I usually draw a quick guideline at first. Just one curve, and its curvature depends on whether the tip is pointing forwards or backwards in relation to us. So this tail would be pointing backwards in this pose. So the guideline curves towards the tip. Let me show you how it would look like the opposite way. This is not right. The tail seems to be pointing towards us now. But that doesn't make any sense. So keep that in mind, and you can add some three dimensionality to your tail very easily. Now this could already be it, but we are going to add a zigzag line along this guideline. I usually start with a slightly curved V-shape around the middle. The tip of the shape is pointing away from the tip of the tail. And then we draw some curves that connect the V-shape with the edges of the tail. Those two lines have the same curvature. Therefore one line is smoothly converging with the edge of the tail, while the other one creates this sharp corner. Let's flip the canvas once again to check for mistakes. Even after drawing those foxes so many times, I still make mistakes occasionally. But that's totally normal and okay. It can be easily fixed. Alright, so with that the sketch is done. The actual outlining and coloring would be up to you, but I can quickly show you how I do it. For the lines I use a thick brush that fades out at the ends, just to soften the overall drawing. The line color is a dark red instead of black, adds a bit of color and reduces the overall contrast a little bit to soften the drawing. I try to be somewhat consistent with the line thickness. Also making the lines a bit thicker adds to the cutesy cartoony look of this little fox. It's also good to draw those lines in one go to make them as smooth as possible, instead of lifting your pen all the time. I use this phase to also make some corrections, instead of perfectly following the imperfect sketch lines. I draw the lines for the fur pattern quite faintly. You could even leave out those lines completely and just paint in the color, if you prefer it that way. Let me speed up the rest of the outlining, because I'm not the fastest while also trying to talk. Now for the coloring. I personally like using softer, more pastel-like colors for those designs. Which ones you use is up to you though, of course. Starting off with orange. Yes, orange, despite them being called red foxes. That's because the word orange is actually relatively new. Only in the 16th century we started using it. Before that, it was just red. Together with other colors like darker magentas. I'm doing the coloring rather quickly, I don't have to be pixel perfect here. And that's also the nice thing about pastel colors on white, missed spots are not that big of a deal. Then a pink color for the inner parts of the ears, making sure that the ear fluff stays white. I also leave a gap between the pink part and the ear outlining. I forgot that I like to thicken the outlining on the ear tips. And lastly, a darker color for the boots and the back of the ears, which we cannot see. Not too dark though, because I don't want too much contrast. The color should still be lighter than the lines. This here is not completely grey. It has a little bit of an orange, making it warmer and fit in better with the other colors. There we go, those colors make quite the difference. You can of course illustrate a red fox without colors, and it's still recognizable as a fox. 
but having colors sure helps. I'm not adding any shading or highlighting to, again, keep it simple. But if you want to include it, then that's totally fine. The second fox design later will have some simple shading. Now let's recap. What parts are actually the most important to make it look like a red fox? Well, because they have such a distinct and well-known look, you really don't need much. Firstly, the fur pattern. You want to have white on the lower part of the face, the chest, belly, and perhaps the tip of the tail. How much the white area covers the face can vary, however, I would say that it should not be higher than eye height. The dark boots are pretty iconic too, but you could leave them out if you want. Instead of orange, you could also go for red, just like the name says, even though it's not realistic, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that it's recognizable, and red works perfectly fine. Having relatively large triangular ears is essential, I would say. Their length, width, pointiness and even the coloring are very much up to you though. I'll give them a pointy snout too. How large or pointy exactly doesn't matter so much, but a flat face would just not fit. And some fluff on the cheeks and maybe on the chest can help too, a more sleek design can also work though. The tail should be at least somewhat long though and shouldn't be too thin. Well, and those are pretty much all the important parts you need to keep in mind to make your design look like a red fox. At least as far as I can tell. Everything else is mostly up to you. Legs and body, for example, can be all sorts of shapes. It could even stand on two legs and be more human-like in stature, like the cute fox from the game Tunic. Which also brings me to an important point. Do not hesitate to get inspiration from already existing fox designs. I mean, they're all inspired by nature in the first place, nothing is completely original. Just make sure you don't break any copyright laws or upset anyone by making your design still different and unique enough. And if your design is largely based on somebody else's, at least credit them. Ok, let's draw this little guy again, but in a more challenging pose. Starting with a circle, and we add the center lines once more. However, this time it's looking slightly upwards and to the side. Therefore, the lines are a bit bent, following the curvature of the circle, which is more like a sphere. Now this time the next step won't be adding more details to the head, but roughly sketching out the body. That's because I want to demonstrate that there isn't a specific order of steps you have to follow. I want the pose to be some kind of happy jumping pose, almost flying even. So in my mind I already have an arch shape, which I can just place down here. This will be the so-called line of action. As the name suggests, the movement and action is strongly expressed along this line. Not exclusively, but to a large part. That line can have all sorts of curvatures and lengths, however it should not be too complex. Usually one continuous curve is enough. And this line is supposed to go from the front feet, across the body, until the back feet. In this case, that is. In other cases, it can be quite different. So let me do exactly that, starting with the front leg that is closer to us. Since this foot is raised up so high, and we look at it slightly from below, it overlaps with the head. The underside is just this flat circular shape. Perspective is important here though. The more that circle faces to the side, the flatter it becomes. Shouldn't forget giving it this little toe bump, of course. The body is again that short sausage shape. Its curvature is also following the line of action. We could have drawn the body before the leg. Again, the order is not that important. But I can recommend to take care of the front layers first, so the parts that are closer to the viewer. Notice also that this time I'm not drawing the triangle shape for the chest. The chest is hidden behind the leg anyways, so there is not really a point to it. In general, you don't have to use every single technique and tip that I'm showing you here. Only do so if it actually makes sense to use. Ok, now the other front leg. That one will point slightly lower. Just to make this drawing not too symmetrical, a bit of variance makes it look more natural. Now the back leg. At first the underside of the paw, then a C curve up here, and an S curve below. I'm drawing these two legs a bit smaller, not because they are smaller, but because of a perspective technique called foreshortening. It basically means that parts that are close to the viewer are significantly larger than the rest. 
Which of course makes sense, and when I demonstrate this with my camera, it's normal to you. But while drawing, people tend to forget about it and rather try to make everything the same size. If you use foreshortening, however, you can achieve a pose that looks much more dynamic and draw the attention more towards the parts that are at the front. So yeah, another technique that I would recommend learning more about. The other hind leg will be hidden behind the tail, so there is no need to sketch it out. We can also add a short line as a guide for the direction of the tail. Not really necessary for a simple short tail like this one, but for other more complex designs it can be useful. Drawing it mostly the same way as last time, just making sure that the tip points the way it's supposed to. Also, the overall shape of the tail can be a bit more stretched in this case, to emphasize that there is a movement going on. Alright, now we have all the basic shapes sketched out. This here is a good point to make some changes if needed. Flipping the canvas would also be a good idea. By the way, if you're not drawing digitally, you can use a mirror instead, or take a photo and then flip it. Now let's add the details. To better show that this is the underside of the foot, we add a paw pad. Yes, singular, because adding all of them would be too much small detail work. And drawing this uni bean is not that unusual, an easy way to simplify the design. Now as for the face, starting with the snout, but this time it's a bit more tricky since it's facing to the side and slightly upwards. Therefore the nose will be placed to the side of the vertical center line and slightly more upwards. And the round curve for the snout has to follow that direction too. The upper end will face towards the center line intersection and the lower end towards the bottom of the head. Gotta keep in mind though that the nose doesn't sit right in the middle of the snout tip but is further up. Therefore we don't immediately curve around. The snout's outermost point is below the nose. You could also draw the snout first and then the nose. It might be even easier in certain situations. Now this time the eyes are drawn as curves pointing upwards. Closed eyes that look happy because this little guy is having a blast. Even though this fox only has button eyes without any details and no eyebrows, you can still have a lot of expressions by changing the shape of the eyes. An upwards curve for being happy, downwards for sleeping or maybe when it's sad, a big circle when it's shocked. You don't have to stick with the exact base design all the time, bend and change things depending on the circumstances. Now for the ears, starting with the right one, which is closer to us. It's drawn pretty much the same way as before, a triangle shape pointing upwards with the fluff inside. The other one however is mostly hidden behind the head because of the head's light tilt upwards. We can also decide that the back side of the ear is visible here, which is even easier to draw because we'll just need to fill it in with the dark color. Of course the fluff at the side should not be forgotten. On the right side it is partially hidden behind the leg in front of it. Gotta make sure that this strand extends over the ear from this perspective. And some fluff picking out on the other side too. Now only the fur patterns are left. The one on the face is pretty much the same, a line that's curved upwards from the nose to below the eye and then a downwards curve to the side. It gets its boots of course too. Once again I pull them upwards a bit on the front legs. Well, on the hind legs they sort of separate the leg into two sections. And we got the zigzag pattern on the tail like before, starting with a V shape in the middle and then connected with the edges of the tail shape. As always, gonna flip the canvas and take a close look for any parts that could use some improvements. And that's it for the sketch. Now to show you another technique, let me do the outlining a little bit differently. Since this drawing uses foreshortening, one way to enhance its perspective effect is through varying your line weight or line thickness. Basically, you outline the parts that are closer to the viewer with thicker lines. How big you make the difference is up to you, however, I wouldn't overdo it. Especially not in this case because the foreshortening is more on the subtle side. There we go, it looks extra neat now. And another thing you could do is making the outermost lines extra thick. That makes it even more cartoony looking. And if you have some kind of background, then your little fox is gonna stick out a whole lot more. 
So yeah, line weight is also something I recommend learning more about. There are a lot of effects that you can achieve by controlling the line thickness of your drawing. Okay, the coloring is pretty much the same again. Just had to include a color for the paw pads. Red foxes have more of a gray color for those, hence my color choice. You can go for pink though if you prefer it. Again, realism is not that important. Gonna speed up the rest of the coloring process. And there we go, it is done. This was more challenging, but the result looks so much more dynamic and interesting than the first drawing. Of course, there is nothing wrong with the first one. For some styles, this kind of simplistic pose is actually more suited. And so often, it depends. Alright, as the third and last drawing, I want to show you how to draw this slightly more complex design. It's significantly longer and sleeker, and therefore more flexible in terms of posing capabilities. But overall, this cute fox is not that hard to draw either. Let me show you. So the plan this time is to draw a very basic pose again, without trying to make it particularly dynamic or action-filled or anything like that. We're gonna have a standing pose from the side, with the fox looking to the back. Therefore, the head is not gonna face sideways, but will be turned. Now for this design, I won't draw a circle, but an oval shape as the base shape of the head. This is a bit more challenging, because the width of the oval depends on its rotation. Keep in mind that these are three-dimensional shapes that you illustrate on a two-dimensional surface. A sphere can always be drawn as a circle, no matter how you rotate it. However, an ovoid, which is a three-dimensional oval shape, does change its two-dimensional shape depending on how you rotate it. But it's not that complicated. It's just one step over the circle shape, and after all, we want to learn how to make designs with all sorts of shapes. Drawing the center lines isn't that much more complicated either. Just imagine yourself halving this shape repeatedly. Vertically, you would create a circular cut, and horizontally an oval cut. Now this might seem like a lot of complicated geometric extra steps, but the thing is, you really don't need to be all that accurate about it. Important is that the head isn't too tall or too wide, and that the centerline intersection is at least somewhat where you need it to be, so here in this case, a bit further to the left. Keep in mind that all of these are guidelines, not the actual lines of your final drawing. Guidelines don't need to be exact. They are just there to, well, <laughs> guide you towards the right direction, and adjustments can still be done. Alright, let's start with the snout. Instead of a round bump, we're going to have a pointy, curved V-shape. We use the intersection point as the starting point, and at first curve down, and then back up again for the tip of the snout. And the second line is connected with the bottom of the head. Make sure that it is also curved. The nose is just the tip of the snout, so we draw a little curve here. Like with the tail before, if it points towards the viewer, you curve it away from the nose tip. And if it points away, you curve it towards the nose tip. So this design is actually going to have a mouth. But once again, we are going to keep it simple. It's just a small mouth drawn on the underside of the snout. If it's closed, just draw one short line. If it's open, then go for a bean shape that might be cut off depending on the angle. And the overall curvature of the shape depends on what kind of expression you want to have. Only if you look at it from below, you can see the full shape. Otherwise, it is cut off by the edge of the snout. There is no need to adjust the shape of the snout though, even though logically there would be a gap when the mouth is opened. But for this cartoony style, you can just cheat and sort of paste it on, and it still looks good that way. Maybe even better. When the mouth is open, I also don't let it make contact with the snout's edge line, but leave a very small gap. For this drawing, I want to go for a mildly surprised and intrigued look, so the mouth is going to have an O shape to it. The eyes are getting a different style too, still very simple though. Firstly, the upper lid. It's just a line that starts at the center line and curves upwards, so that the inner eye corner is higher. This angle makes the eyes look softer and sort of friendlier. The other side gets a little bit more squished, since the face is not perfectly flat, but has some curvature to it. And then the pupils, which are these vertical oval shapes. Fits the fact that red foxes have vertical slits as pupils too. This one is going to look to the back, so both pupils are gonna face hard right. Okay, we have a lot more possibilities now for expressions with this eye design, compared to the button eyes of the previous one. Next up, let's adjust the head shape a bit, and make it fluffier looking. 
Similar to the previous design, we add some fluff strands. We draw a short line along the center line going over the head shape a bit and then connect with the bottom of the head again. Then we draw an S-curve to connect with the top of the head. With that shape we can make the strands pointier looking and then smoothly transition to the round top. Alright, now for the ears. For this design we're gonna give them quite some extra curvature. To further illustrate that this fox is intrigued by something that's going on behind it, let's rotate the ears to the back, because foxes can orientate their ears to where the sound is coming from. It is easier to start with the inner side of the ear. The curve is kept relatively low, it is quite long though. Then we draw the other side. Both sides follow the same curvature, resulting in a pointy ear tip. The outer side, however, is slightly more curved. To further indicate that this ear is rotated to the back, we're gonna draw another curve to separate the back part of the ear from the front part. Now the ear definitely doesn't look like it's pointing towards us, but behind the fox. For this style, let's actually draw no fluff, but instead there will be a hatching pattern. Drawing the other ear, it is also rotated to the back, although not quite the same amount, and we can only see its backside. Sometimes it can make your drawing more interesting looking if not everything is symmetrical, so this ear is gonna stand up a bit higher. Pay attention to the gap between the ears. The more the head is facing sideways, the smaller the gap becomes, until the ears start overlapping. The last thing left for the face is the fur pattern, gonna draw it pretty much the same way as with the first fox design. So a line that curves upwards from the nose to beneath the eyes and then a downwards curve to the tip of the fluff. Keep in mind though that these curvatures can change depending on the view angle. For example this version here where the fox looks upwards, both of the lines are curved upwards too to follow the shape of the head. By the way, did you notice that none of my fox designs have whiskers? Even though real foxes clearly do. That's because the face has the highest concentration of lines and features going on, and adding more for some whiskers would just overload everything. They are not essential for the fox's expression or recognizability, and we want to keep things as simple as possible after all, so just don't draw them. But of course, if you want to have them added and you find a good way to do so, then you should totally go for it. Alright, moving on to the body. Let's start with the triangular shape for the chest this time. In this version it is quite narrow and long, and is also not centered to the bottom of the head, but slightly shifted to the back. It is also curved outwards by quite a significant amount, the chest is supposed to really stick out. The overall height of it is a bit higher than the height of the head. And you can see it is once again a combination of a C curve and an S curve. Here's a reminder again to flip your canvas and take a close look to find anything that needs to be corrected. To sketch out the body shape we draw a line down the neck and then make a tight turn to the spine creating a wavy curve. And the other line starts from the bottom of the chest and goes upwards. It's slightly converging, meaning that the body gets thinner further back. This adds to the slender, even kind of elegant look of this fox design. Let's go for the legs now, starting with the front legs again. Draw a line from the bottom of the chest down, very slightly curved. They are quite long this time, longer than the height of the head, but also quite thin. This thickness of the front legs is pretty much constant, perhaps it can be a bit wider further up, just ever so slightly. You can draw them at first without the feet, and then add the feet as an extra step. For that we just start from the front bottom of the foot and draw the C curve up and across the foot. It looks a bit lifted up, that C curve is not even, but has more curvature at the top. It just fits the design better, in my opinion. The second front leg is going to be raised for this pose. We just draw a line that hooks around and then hides behind the leg in front of it. This makes it look like the fox was walking, and then suddenly got interrupted by something that's going on behind it. Now as for the hind legs, let's follow a different approach. We're gonna build them up from the bottom. So at first we decide where the feet are standing. You can also extend the line from the front foot as an orientation. The foot that is further at the back will be placed slightly above that line, and let's put it further forwards too. Having both hind legs stand at the same spot looks a bit stiff after all. We draw two short lines upwards, the one further at the back is slightly longer. How you angle those lines depends on where the feet stand relative to the hip. The further behind they stand, the more the ankle rotates towards the body. 
so this one is almost vertical, while the other one that stands further at the front has a lower angle. Then you just have to connect these parts with the hip. For that purpose draw two curves, one goes all the way to the lower back and one that goes to the belly. This will form the second leg part, which gets thicker the further up it goes. Knowing some facts about fox anatomy can be especially useful here. It's not necessary, but it helps drawing body parts that actually look plausible, even for a simplified cartoony design. And it turns out that two weeks after the release of this video, I will publish another fox tutorial. It is going to explain the anatomy more in detail and be overall more advanced. I would recommend learning about it. It is easier to make those cartoony designs if you already have an idea of how these animals are built. You know, learn the rules to later break them however you need. That applies to many aspects of art. Again though, it is not necessarily required, just helpful. And also fascinating to learn, at least in my opinion. Ok, back to the drawing. We still need to add a tail. Now this design has a much longer and more flexible tail than the previous one, so we have a lot more freedom in shaping it. And its shape can add a lot to the overall pose and composition of the fox. Let's go for an upwards curved tail. I personally find it easier to start with the upper side of the tail and sketch out a simple C curve. Its length is about the same as the body length, maybe slightly longer and the curvature is decisive for how the tail is going to look like. A perfect C, or maybe pulled up a little, or sort of stretched out. There are many different possibilities and all of them change the appearance of the fox. So being aware and having control over how you shape those simple lines makes quite a difference. Then at the tip we create a corner that is almost 90 degrees and curve around until it reached its full thickness. Imagine a cap over the tip of the tail. This is the section where the thickness steadily changes and after that is the section where the thickness stays constant until it reaches the root where it abruptly gets thinner. And then for this particular design we cut away a corner right here so that we have a small spike at the base. A little stylistic choice. Since this tail is a lot more flexible, you can use S-curves to give it a wavier look, like you can see here with these examples. Now the chest needs more shaping too. For that purpose, we draw a line from the bottom of the chest and extend it outwards. Around where the neck begins, we draw a V-shape that is curved upwards, form a second spike sticking out and curve back to the bottom of the head. On the other side we add a corner around midway through that is a lot flatter. Now the chest looks a lot fluffier. How exactly you shape the fluff sort of depends on the situation. For example, let's take a look at these drawings where the fox stands on a ball and then falls off. In the first one the spikes are clearly pointing upwards. The whole pose very much is stretched upwards, so this fluff follows the direction too. The second one however is a falling pose and so instead the chest fluff is following that falling trajectory together with the legs and the tail. These are still images, so you gotta use techniques like these to convey that there is movement going on. Ok, the only thing that is left is the remaining fur pattern. This design gets some boots too. They are also stretched upwards at the front and reach up quite high overall. And for the hind legs they serve kind of as a separator between the two leg parts. The tip could be drawn in all sorts of ways, but since I like the previous pattern, I'm going for it again. Just a bit longer. A V-shape in the middle and the two lines on both sides that converge with the edges of the tail. Lastly, let's once again flip the canvas to check for any parts to fix. Sometimes it's also a good idea to just leave the drawing and come back later. And that way you sort of look at it with new eyes. And so the sketch is done. Even though it was more challenging than the first design, it was still pretty simplistic. I'm also gonna do the outlining and coloring real quick. We are not done yet though, let's add some shading this time. However, we're gonna keep it very simple. Do not worry too much about it being realistic, it's just supposed to add a little bit more 3 dimensionality to it. As for the shading colors, they are as so often up to you, but I would recommend that you use a slightly blue or purplish color for the white parts and a warmer sort of red color for the orange parts. 
To make things easy for myself, since I'm using digital methods, I can just use a multiply layer and use this sort of purple pastel color and all the underlying colors will be darkened by this layer. Okay, there are parts that definitely should get some shading. That is, the legs that are further at the back, the neck and bottom of the head, and the inside parts of the ears. We don't actually think about the direction of the light source all that much. Well, you could, but here I just want to keep things simple. So we also add some shading to the underside of the tail to make it a bit rounder looking, and some for the underside of the belly too. If there are parts overlapping, then drop shadows should get added too. Not so much the case here, but you can see it in my other examples. Like this one, where these two foxes are happily running around. The fox at the front casts drop shadows on the one in the back. But not all of them are realistic. For example, the entire tail of the fox in the back received some shading, so that the fox at the front sticks out more, to create more contrast. Think of the shadows as tools to enhance your designs. They are part of your designs. How you shape them can improve your artworks. Realism is not as important as good design. The shadows just need to look plausible enough. We could also add some highlighting, like some white edges in the colored areas. However, I decided to not include it to keep it still simple. But how you design your fox is completely up to you. I said it often enough already, but I really want to encourage you to create your own cute little foxes. It's a lot of fun. I made a couple of other designs beside these two. Not all of them turned out all that great, but that's fine. It's part of the process. I definitely recommend making several versions, so that you can then choose the one that you like the best. Experiment around with all sorts of shapes. This one, for example, used more triangular shapes. Or you could go for some funky looking ones, like this one that I made with lots of straight parallel lines. Despite its silly design, it's still recognizable as a fox. And then of course, if you're more familiar with fox anatomy, you can go for more realistic design. This one has more accurate body proportions, and the mouth is actually not just pasted on, but has a movable lower jaw. There are endless possibilities, even for just one type of animal. And if you get better at designing your own simple fox character, other kinds of animals and creatures will become easier to design for you too. A lot of the techniques and knowledge are applicable to other situations. Here is a list of the techniques that I've shown and mentioned in this video, in case you want to look them up and practice further. No need to overwhelm yourself with new stuff though. Follow your own pace. I already threw enough at you in this video. Perhaps it's a bit overwhelming for beginners? That's why I wanted to remind you several times that you don't have to retain everything from the get-go. There is no test awaiting you or anything, and you can obviously rewatch this video anytime. It's not gonna go anywhere. And if those techniques seem intimidating to you, like they are only suited for advanced artists, then I'll tell you that this is not the case. Almost all of the techniques can be learned at any point, independently from each other. If you want to start practicing for shortening, for example, go for it. I personally believe that there is no universally optimal order of things to learn for artists. It depends on your own goals and preferences. One thing's for sure though, Experimentation, constantly trying out new things, is key to improving your artistic skill set. Alright, enough preaching from me. Now go and draw lots and lots of cute and pretty foxes. And if you're feeling up for it, perhaps watch my other fox tutorial that goes more into their anatomy and how to draw them realistically. Also, if you found this video useful and want to help me make more, then there are several ways to do so. You could check out my merch shop. Where I got all sorts of neat stuff, like these cute little foxes as stickers and patterns and all sorts of other stuff and many other designs. Or you could join my Patreon, also unlocking all sorts of rewards. By the way, here are all of my current patrons. I appreciate the support so very much. So then, as always, if you have any questions or constructive feedback, then please let me know in the comments down below. Thank you a lot for watching and have fun drawing.